Okay, so um, so the first thing I want to cover is something that I probably cannot give um, appropriate justice to, and that is the extended trip that Donald Trump took to Japan, to South Korea, to China, to Vietnam, and the Philippines. Um, for the people of those nations and the people of other nations who were present at some of these conferences, like in Vietnam and, and, and the Philippines, this was a very different president than they're used to seeing. Um, even Medvedev, who was the, the Prime Minister of Russia, was at the conference in the Philippines, remarked that Trump is very open and, and very, um, uh, he's very open. He's not, he's not closed. Uh, now, um, the Chinese welcome Trump in a way they have not welcomed anybody in their entire history. Um, um, they closed off the Forbidden City and, 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 and Trump and, and, and his wife spent a day being, being, being the tour by, by Xi, the president of China. They got a dose, extended dose of the history of China and, and the culture of China. And they got to see some operas. And um, now Trump had this to say at, at one of these things. You've got to get a sense of this. He said, yesterday we visited the Forbidden City which stands as a proud symbol of China's rich culture and majestic spirit. Your nation is a testament to thousands of years of vibrant living history, and today it was a tremendous honor to be greeted by the Chinese delegation right here at the Great Hall of the People. <coughs> this moment in history presents both our nations with an incredible opportunity to advance peace and prosperity alongside other nations all around the world. In the words of a Chinese problem, we must carry forward the cause and forge ahead into the future. I'm confident that we can realize this wonderful vision, a vision that will be so good and in fact so great for both China and the United States. So we've come from different places and farewell land, for faraway lands. There is much that binds the East and West. Both our countries were built by people of great courage, strong culture, and a desire to trek across the unknown to great danger that they overcame. The people of the United States have a very deep respect for the heritage of your country and noble traditions of its people. Your ancient values bring past and future together into the present. So beautiful. It is my hope that the proud spirits of the American Chinese people will inspire our efforts to achieve a more just, secure, and peaceful world, a future worthy of the sacrifices of our ancestors and the dreams of our children. Now, um, that was the tenor of his presentations throughout um, his, what he said. And to the Vietnamese people, he said that he admired their, their, their spirit of independence for 2,000 years, which meant that he admired the fact that they kicked the U.S.'s ass and mm -hmm. etc. So he, he wasn't doing this, you know, he wasn't doing this liberal thing, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, human rights and, and no, no human rights stuff. He didn't do any human rights stuff. I respect whatever. You know, I respect your country. I respect your traditions. I respect your, your, um, uh, your. So he wasn't coming in with the 
with the arrogance of the ugly American. Uh, you know, he was coming in uh, respecting the, the nation, respecting his people, respecting his governments, respecting his traditions. Now, so that's, that's on that aspect of it. In the middle of all this, there were roughly $253 billion initially signed uh, deals, and three times more is coming. So you're looking at another um, 500 to $750 billion for the trade agreements that will happen. Most of that is currently for not building the United States up. Part of it is, but it's mostly for getting various parts of the United States industrial well, not so much industrial, but raw material and agriculture and oil and gas and the pipeline in Alaska and, and different things like that. But the point is, is it, it helps the United States a lot. And it also uh, sets in motion a certain process. Now, but that's only the small part of the actual economic aspect. The actual profound aspect of the economic aspect is now taking place. Um, the mayor of Houston is going in two weeks to China with a delegation of 50 business people. Okay. We're talking about a big projects in Texas. All of the governors are now who are having trouble with their economy, having trouble with putting their people to work. They're all looking to China as a source uh, business. You know, what can we, you know, how can we participate in this? And all of the, the firms, the, the actual, not the major corporations, but the actual, well, some of them are major, but the actual manufacturing potentials in these, in these areas now have, are, are looking for markets. And where are the markets going to come from? They're going to come from China's expanding base of consumption, but also they're going to come from participation in projects all over the world. So essentially, a green light exists for people to move with their feet into the Belt and Road. It's not like the United States has announced that we're going into the Belt and Road, but there's not going to be any restrictions or harassment or shutting down of, 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 of state governments and local governments and, 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 and U.S. business from going to making deals with the Chinese. It's not going to happen. I mean, there might be a big attack on this in Congress, but it's, it's not come, going to come from the administration. So this is very important, because what, this is a huge uh, thing that's occurring. And I can't even begin to tell you all the state governments that are sending delegations and, and, and so forth and so on. I mean, it's huge. And, you know, they're not considered, you know, traders to China, to, to, to America for doing this, you know. So, so that's another aspect of it. Now, what is happening at the state level in the United States is also happening all over Africa, it's happening all over Asia, it's happening all over, there's even discussion going on with India now, India is now back on the discussion process with, with China on all of this. It's Eastern Europe is coming in and this is causing a disruption in Europe because a lot of Eastern European countries are not in good shape and, you know, you know, the European Union has not been, shall we say, very, a, a very good experience for them economically. And as a result, you know, they're looking at East, you know, Poland and Ukraine and, and a lot of these Eastern Europe countries have a certain capability left over from the, the times of, uh, when they were part of the Soviet bloc that they have a certain industrial and, 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 and scientific but also a skilled workforce. They want to get those people working and they're not going to they're not going to get them working by working within the European Union. They're going to have to go outside the European Union. So you have all kinds of frictions building inside Europe because all these Eastern European countries are even are now starting to get antsy and want to want to work with uh, the Belt and Road. And then you have you know NATO trying to establish a European military to you know come down on, on any effort to, to 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 break away from the European Union or or break away in terms of your own. You know, and then you have, you know, Angela Merkel and the federal government of Germany opposing the Belt and Road, but at the same time you have all of the local 
uh, the industry people, all of the local state uh, governments are now trying to get into the Belt and Road. So this is all happening at the same time. Everywhere in the world, in Italy, same thing. You know, you have the same thing going on in Greece. You have it all, you have all, everyone's now reorienting to the new system. Because they all know the system is dead. They all know the system that we talked about um, earlier this afternoon is dead. They all know that. And uh, the huge delegation of all places, Panama, was in China. Panama finally uh, stopped recognizing Taiwan and started recognizing China. And they sent a huge delegation. Well, you know what that means. That means a new Panama Canal uh, and so forth and so on. So all of this is going on. Now, that, however, in Europe, in the European media, and in the U.S. media, and the Canadian media, this transformation, this reality, this, the significance of the trip that Trump made is, it made is not being reported. In fact, the opposite is being reported. You know, Trump is selling out to the dictators, to the communists, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, but what's going on? Why, why are they suppressing this knowledge? Because if people started to find out what was really going on, and what this all meant, what it means for West Virginia, where over 20 years there's an $83 billion investment that the Chinese have made, or in Arkansas, or these are poor places. But people start to realize what's going on. There is a deeper uh, thing in people that precedes uh, the Cold War, and that, and that is the, the, what I call the Franklin Delano Roosevelt reflex. And they are fearful that the North American and European population will be infected with a cultural optimism that used to exist culturally uh, from the period of Lincoln's victory in the Civil War all the way through to um, the end of World War II. In general, the cultural optimism, in spite of the World War I, in spite of World War II, there was a general belief that, that things were going to go progressive, progress, progress. And after World War II, especially right after World War II, there was a great feeling because of the, the defeat of, 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 of Nazi Germany and the Axis power, that now the, now the potential exists for a world to, to have nations and have the nations promote development. You had the United Nations being created. It was great optimism, great, great optimism. So the fear is that that, that, that impulse that existed uh, with Franklin Delano Roosevelt that built the United States, and, and which, which economic power in, in large part, with what Stalin did, defeated, um, uh, <coughs> defe well, defeated the Nazis and, and so in Japan, that that, that that optimism would, would, would uh, is going to come back now. And uh, uh, that that kind of FDR conception, that kind of mentality is going to come back. And that is the greatest fear. And this is exactly what is needed to bring the world into the new paradigm, is that in the United States and Europe there, and in Canada, there is a return to a much earlier <coughs> belief in progress, a much earlier conception of a uh, of man that existed prior to the um, uh, prior to the 60s, prior to what happened, and I'm going to get into what happened. So to understand this vile suppression of the knowledge of of what is happening with the one belt one road and what happened with Trump's trip, the general population and the political class is now being directed towards getting a Cold War against China and Russia, a new Cold War against China and Russia, which has been on the way for some time. And one, uh, to understand the situation, one must go back to the earlier Cold War and the role of an institution called the Congress of Cultural Freedom. Or in other words, where did all this come from? Okay, so, so briefly, the Cold War was launched officially by Churchill under, under President Truman. The purpose of the Cold War, besides dividing the world into two opposing camps, 
was much deeper. The Cold War began to shift of an orientation of the general population of North America and Europe from the post-war optimism of a potential future era of progress uh, for the world as a whole to one of defeating communism. The idea of defeating communism was the cover used to extend a de facto colonial policy to the emerging post-colonial war. Rather than ushering in FDR's idea of rapidly developing these new sovereign nations, you had a Cold War, and on the basis of that, you justified <coughs> coups all over the world, from Iran to Guatemala, to the Vietnam War, to you name it. Uh, and, and all the regime changes and assassination of, of leaders and all of that was justified under a Cold War. And to understand that this is the context, uh, uh, this, is the, uh, this is an aspect of the context of what we're dealing with. Now, it is the case that uh, two years ago, a little more than two years ago, Putin addressed the United Nations General Assembly in 2015, which is a call to return to the original intention of the UN Charter of Sovereign Nations. And this was immediately preceding the intervention into Syria. So Putin made it very clear that the purpose of the intervention into Syria to defeat ISIS was to usher in a period of a return to the respect for the Charter of Sovereign Nations of the United Nations and an end to proxy wars and an end to this kind of uh, intervention all over the world, regime changes and all of that. So this is a very important point to understand it that that was what Putin laid out. And he laid out a program of, co of nations cooperating to deal with the problems that all of this has created. The Cold War created, not just in, you had the Soviet Union problem involved in this as well. And uh, so now, um, but under the cover of the Cold War, something much more destructive was launched. What was launched under the cover of the Cold War was a deeper countercultural revolution to the culture that had existed previously, after fascism had been defeated. And the agency that was created officially uh, in the 1950s to do this was something called the Congress of Cultural Freedom. And at its height, okay, its official existence was from eight, 1950 to 1967. It, uh, it's, uh, it, it was terminated after a massive revelations of the fact that it was massively largely funded by, by covert CIA fund funding. At its height, it was active in 35 countries and ran 120 publications. Okay, and most of its funding was covertly from the CIA. And not only was the Congress of Culture Freedom the founder and promoter of the counterculture, its mission was to root out all the cultural aspects of the earlier FDI, FDR, and pre prior to the Renaissance, from the Renaissance to FDR, progress, human, uh, the, the paradigm of progress, in, in, uh, yeah, scientific progress, yeah, um, that had earlier been the basis of FDR's economic recovery uh, from the Depression. And not only does this go deeper by rooting out the FDR legacy? The intention was to root out culturally any legacy or allegiance to the principle of the sovereign nation state, or to the principle of what the sovereign nation state was, which emerged out of the Renaissance, uh, which is not an imperial concept, which is the, the, the concept of the, of, of the general welfare. Because the whole idea of the existence of a nation is to promote the general welfare. That's the original concept of the commonwealth. So the emergence of nations, but nations are not arbitrary things. Nations 
are centered around a, a shared language culture. So you have a shared language culture in a nation which can represent the interests of the population as a whole. And it has a way of, this, uh, because it has a shared language culture, it has a way of, of, of creating not only an identity of a one, but also a way of, of having the ability to communicate within that culture and come to an understanding of what is in the interest of that, of, of that culture, what is in the interest of that nation. And it's not a question of democracy, it's not against democracy, but it's a question of a, of a, of a quality of discussion in the, in, in, among, among the members of that language culture. Now keep in mind that while this came out of the Renaissance, and this idea of the general welfare uh, uh, it comes out of the Renaissance, and it gets, you know, there's a lot of history, but, but the point is they wanted to remove any kind of basis for all of this in the society. And this was considered essential to destroy any underlying cultural basis for the nation state and the more deeper issues of the nation state in order to provide uh, the future culture for a world government and a globalized empire. So this is what, this is the purpose of the Congress of Cultural Freedom. Is, is to, is to eradicate this idea of, 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 of the nation state and the idea of, of, of and, 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 and they, were able, they, they were able to run this under the, the context of the Cold War of, and justify everything they did as, as, as part of the Cold War. Now, I'll take you to a, a Wikipedia here. I'm not saying, I'm not encouraging uh, <laughs> you to go to Wikipedia. But, we do anyway. <laughs> but anyhow, um, so I won't read you what they say. I'll just say that the founding conference of the Cult Congress of Culture Freedom was attended by leading intellectuals from the USA, Western Europe. Among those who came to Berlin in June were the writers in 18, 1950, were writers, philosophers, critics, and historians. Some of these names might mean something to some of you, some of them probably most of them won't. Franz Borkenau, Carl Jaspers, very important guy, John Dewey, Ignacio Silone, Jane Burnham, you know who Jane Burnham is, oh, Hugh yeah. Trevor Roper, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., Bertrand Russell played a very key role, <laughs> Ernst Ruder, Raymond Aaron, Alfred Ayer, Benadolce Croce, oh my god, Arthur Kostler, Richard Lowenthal, Melvin J. Lansky, Tennessee Williams, the, the uh, author, Sidney Hook, very important. There were conservatives among the participants, but non-communist and former communist left-wingers were more numerous. And the man who would become the godfather neo, of the neoconservatism was also there, Irving Crystal, the father of the other Crystal, whatever his name is. So, now, so one of the first things that they did, okay, was take over this whole project of denazification. So, so what they did is they shifted the whole idea of where Hitler came from to to uh, 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 they, they confused everything, and uh, they made the German people the guilty party in um, in, in Hitler. It was, you know Hitler did a number on the German people, but it's the German people's inherent um, problems, inherent culture, which was the cause of Hitler rather than the British bankers and the U.S. bankers who put Hitler into power. They weren't the problem. They weren't the problem in, in this situation. You know, it was the German people's you know, mindset and their belief in, and their, uh, so they, they got everything very confused. And to this day, the Germans are still suffering from 
an inability to act on their own behalf for fear that they're going to be called uh, Nazis. Okay. Another major thing they went after was music, classical music. And they began promoting this atonal music as, as, the, as the music to destroy, uh, to destroy the culture. Why? Because in classical music, you have a Renaissance conception of man embedded in classical music. And they wanted to destroy that. That classical music uh, is, and, they, and they, put, they basically said that classical music is what caused Hitler. That's what they basically said. That, that was the kind of the, the, the thing that they, that they were promoting. Okay. The other thing they attacked philosophically was the knowability, the possibility of human knowability of, 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 of truth or principles. These, these, the, the ability to discover and be creative. Uh, the, the knowability, the potential, know, the potential of human beings to know and have increasing capacities to know truth, the truth, is at the center of the concept of the nation state. And that a sovereign nation within a language culture can deliberate and dialogue, and from that determine and act in the interest of the general welfare. That is knowable. Without the ability to dialogue on that basis, there is no practical common good. It is only your opinion versus my opinion versus my, my interest versus your interest, my little group's interest versus your little group's interest. But we can't get together and have a dialogue among us to decide what is in the interest of all of us. Because that involves a concept of knowing what's in the interest of all of us. And if you know what's in the interest of all of us, then you have, you have the potential for bringing people together. But in this idea, you can't, you can't, you're not allowed to do that philosophically. It is only the interest of, so, so, so you completely destroyed the idea of, 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 of a nation to, to the various components that are competing for whatever. But the, but, but the idea that you can actually bring people together around, you can bring the working class and the industrialists and the farmer and around a consensus, of, around a concept of what's in the general interest gets all Screwed. And if you say that you can, like FDR did, you're labeled a fascist. Because you're, you're saying that you, have, you know the truth of what is good for this nation or for the people, for what's good for everybody. You're imposing a totalitarian uh, uh, conception on you. You have no right to do that. That was the culture that they started going after. So essentially, it totally disrupted the, 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 the ability to function, the, or I'm just a state legislator, or I'm just a, a, a provincial legislator, or I'm just a this, I'm just a that. You know, I deal with my thing. I don't, I don't think about the, the national good, because that's, 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 that's a, um, I'm not, I don't have a right to, 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 to um, I'm just, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, it totally disrupted the, the, the situation. And, uh, and anyone who emerged politically in Europe or in the United States and said, let's bring people together around a common interest, they were assassinated or destroyed or, or, or vilified or whatever. Martin Luther King was doing that. That's why he was assassinated. Okay. Kennedy was doing that. He was assassinated. You know, uh, others were sent, went to jail because they were, they were doing that. And, and then we had the, the, the rock drug sex counterculture, which was brought in by people who were participating in the, the Congress of Culture Freedom, people like uh, Margaret Mead. And, and they turned, they crushed the left. Uh, and and you, see the, you see this in, in, in the left today. They're very, um, you know, they don't have a conception of, of, of the total interest. And there was an intellectual left coming out of World War II that looked at um, the collaboration of the United States with the Soviet Union in, 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 in the war effort. And that we're looking at the future development of the world. They were leftists, yes. Some of them were liberals, yes. But 
they they were not they were not in, they they were intellectually oriented. They actually had a conception of of uh, of the of a positive future for mankind. They got crushed in, in the in the McCarthy period. They got crushed. <coughs> They were all targeted. <coughs> uh, they, were, they were being targeted to denounce communism <coughs> and so forth and so on. And the intellectual class in the United States and Europe were destroyed. The intellectual class, the independently thinking intellectual class of the United States and of Western Europe uh, were, were destroyed by, by this whole process. You don't have thinkers who who, uh, <coughs> who are willing to challenge the the, the existing axioms of, 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 of that have been imposed upon upon them. And when you do have somebody like Lyndon LaRouche, who came on the scene in a very big way uh, in the United States, in the left, but he came on the scene in a very big way uh, in. Uh, in 1971, he had a debate with Alba Lerner at the end of 71, just after the dollar collapsed. And the, the, the debate with Alba Lerner, who was a leading Keynesian economist, uh, Alba Lerner was not expecting that LaRouche was outside the left-right box completely. And he was, he was, he, he was not only de defeated, but he was forced to admit at the end that Hitler would not have been needed to enforce a discipline on the population, economic discipline on the population of Germany, if the German population had gone along with Helmar Schott's policies, who was the finance minister of, if they had imposed austerity, if they had agreed to, to have austerity, um, and so forth. So, now, after that debate, which, which, while it wasn't in the general population, it was in the intellectual circles, of New York and, and, and of the left. Sidney Hook, one of the key people in the, um, in the uh, Congress of Cultural Freedom, singled out Lyndon LaRouche and said, you won the debate, but you'll never have another debate again. And LaRouche has not had another debate with any significant person since 1971. No one will debate LaRouche. Uh, and this, is, this came down from the, con from the people who were part of, earlier part of the, the Congress of Cultural Freedom. Now, so let's go a little deeper to this. What started off as an anti-communist cover instead became a cultural war against the very FDR Kennedy view that would have altered communism or replaced it with national development, which is essentially what's happened. Kennedy's view was communism would be changed or would cease to exist if you had global economic development. In other words, the whole issue of communism as an enemy would have been modified. Whatever problems communism has, or whatever repressive tendencies were in communism, which were increased by the Cold War, those repressive tendencies were increased by the Cold War. But if you didn't have a Cold War, and you had collaboration with, with the Soviet Union on areas that you could collaborate with, which was Kennedy's view, then, 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 then the pressure uh, would, would decline, and there would be no more openness in, in the Soviet Union, and then they would essentially, in participating in development, they would undergo whatever changes they would undergo as a result. The same with China. The problem was as long as you maintain the state of war, the state of constant war, state of tension between uh, uh, these, this thing, then you actually increase the repressive tendencies in both systems against their people. And, and uh, so we're, what I'm going to say now is that as a result of what's happened in China, what's happening with Russia, what's happening with the Belt and Road Initiative, and now what's happening with the different approach, that, uh, the different personality, and different approach of Donald Trump and his trip to Asia, we're at a point of potentially causing an eruption of a new paradigm which has latency in an earlier paradigm and this has been our mission all along. In effect, this is what we, we were fighting, the Congress of Cultural Freedom orientation from the very beginning, 
And now we have a chance to over, overturn that entire paradigm. Now, another key feature of the Congress of Culture Freedom is the promotion of sex in a political sense. Um, sexuality as a political uh, expression of, you know, instead of family and working class and farming and industry, you now you have the entrance of sex into politics. Uh, the feminist uh, Gloria Steinem was part of this whole operation. She was also CIA, and and they launched these to, to turn to, to to sexual politics. It became uh, predominant. The drugs, sexual politics, and the idea is is sex also as a distraction. And right now you're seeing that in space in the U.S. You're seeing uh, all these sex scandals, which are, you know, they're not they're. They're, they're a form of distracting people from anything real, uh, you know. And so, the other major consequence of this cultural warfare that was launched, and it, it didn't end in 1967, but it, it went off in, in other directions and was still co coherent, is, is that you had, <coughs> you had two different things emerging. One was the uh, was the destruction of, 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 of um, morality, an amoral, a amoral culture emerge. At the same time as you have a reaction to that amoral culture in the end times religions and charismatic Christianity and so forth and so on. So now you have these two different things operating, but they're playing off against each other. And you see that today in the United States. You see, you see this divide. Um, and and, um, and 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 it's it's just uh, again neither neither one of these tr trends have any conception of the general welfare. There's complete insanity here, or the ability to have any shared concept of the good. Now, okay, so uh, now the history of the Larouche movement is totally embedded with the fight against this, um, and. The corruption of the intellectual class and the attacks on LaRouche, which began in earnest in the late 1970s, based on slander, and slander too of all those who would who didn't accept the slanders. So if you so the LaRouche movement was slander. It was a cult, it was anti-Semitic, it was racist, it was communist, it was fascist. We were agents of the Vatican. We were agents of the Vatican as well. And a cult. But if you didn't accept that viewpoint, especially after 18, 1986, after, after 1986 when, uh, when the mass attack on LaRouche was most prominent, and then uh, especially after that, uh, then you were slandered as, 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 and so forth. And that's been, that's been kept up to this day. And that's, that's universally in the European and, and, and Western media. That has been universally enforced. In every article where anyone is mentioned, where LaRouche is mentioned, it is, it is, an, it is a slam. Uniform. Everywhere. However, that plays differently in China and Russia and other parts of the world. Who were people who have who are not under the the mind control of the and the brainwashing of the system? They have a chance to figure it out for themselves, and there there the name Lurush has a different will have a different um, in Africa or Latin America or most of Asia. The the Lyndon Lurush has they have a different opinion of Lyndon Lurush. It's not it's very different from the slam. And however, despite all of this, we kept alive. Uh, the Franklin Delano reflex inside the United States, long past its, its when it should have been dead, and we fought for this reflex uh, in the Democratic Party, outside the Democratic Party. We ran Marouche for president uh, uh, a total of eight times total uh, to keep alive this 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 thing. And, uh, and, and there was, 
there was a fact, there was a, a tendency within the Democratic Party that resonated with us up until the Obama administration and got pretty much crushed in. And, uh, well, it busted up since then. It's got totally busted up. And otherwise, Trump would never have been elected president um, because the Democratic Party um, was totally, totally us. Uh, the Democratic Party under Obama and then Hillary involved, they completely suppressed the FDR element of the Democratic Party and the FDR element rebelled. And that's partly why Trump was elected. <laughs> now, now, this whole this whole situation in China is very critical because what's happening, I'll give you an example. Uh, on Thursday I was at a meeting in Bellevue, sponsored by the Bellevue Chinese Chamber of Commerce and another Chinese organization called Nanhai. And in the audience were about 20 to 25 people from that organization, along with some of our people. And it was it was a seminar conducted by Mike uh, Stager on the, the Belt and Road as the antidote to the coming financial collapse. And what, what happened is when Mike said, how many people here believe that the um, U.S. press properly covered the, uh, the trip? <laughs> and nobody would raise their hand. He says, how many people here saw the actual thing on the ch in the Chinese media. Everyone raised their hand. And then one guy got up and said that we, we're, we, we were all supporting Democrats until, but now we're all going to be supporting Trump. And the, the point is, is that the Chinese community in the United States, in San Francisco, they're prominent, in New York they're prominent, they can see the fundamental difference between the coverage uh, and as an example. I'm just giving you this as an example. So you see this, this change beginning to take place. So we're going to be make, we're making an all-out effort to reach out to the Chinese community because now the Chinese community is going to be very open to uh, working, uh, 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 to be better developed and better uh, 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 deployed uh, to support these policies. But the key, the key thing to understand is that what is being threatened is the revival of the underlying uh, remnant cultural reflex of, 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 that comes out of FDR, Kennedy, King. This is being threatened. This is the threat. And everything must be done to suppress the news of what is going on. And how are they going to suppress the news? When you go to Africa and you see a better train rail than you see in the United States, how are you gonna how are you gonna suppress reality? You know, this stuff is coming on facts. This is this is not something which is, I mean, they put the Belt and Road in the Communist Party constitution. I mean, it's not, it's it's like everybody in China, every everybody out overseas in China is being told, we're doing this. This is a unified policy. Of a, of a nation of 1.4 million people, and we're, we're, some, we're, we're going to do everything possible to get it going. And that means you talk to everybody, every businessman goes to everywhere. I mean, this whole thing is just taking off. And how are you going to suppress that reality? How are you going to suppress that reality? <coughs> so that's a very important aspect of it. Now, the second very important aspect of it is the following. One of the things that Trump did he did not go bureaucratic in any way in his trip. He established a personal relationship with Abe, with Moon, with Xi Jinping, with the leaders of Vietnam, with Duterte. What does that mean? You don't have to go through, if there's a problem, you go to Trump. If there's a problem, Trump goes to Xi or Abe or Moon or what have you. This is very important. You know who I am, I know who you are, we know each other, you know I'm for real, I know you're for real. Okay, we talk. We got a problem, we talk. We do it directly. We don't go through our bureaucracies. I mean, of course, in the U.S., you can't really go through your bureaucracy because of the 
bureaucracy wants to wants you dead. <laughs> but but what this means? Now, now in a very small example of this was these UCLA uh, spoiled brat basketball stars who went to China and went to a high end. Uh, a store and started and shoplifted and got caught. Now that's a very serious offense in China. Yeah. And they were looking at 20 years. <laughs> and Trump made a phone call and uh, they, they got home right away. But Paul, my question is, did they really do uh, it? Or was it kind of staged? Hold on, hold on. Let me finish. The point I'm making is, that's nothing. But what I'm saying is, what happens when the financial system collapses? What will the conversation be between Xi Jinping and Trump? Between Xi Jinping and Putin? Between Putin and Trump? Between Abe, Putin, and Trump, and Xi Jinping? What, are the, what is the conversation going to be? What are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this? That's my, that's my conception. Of what, why, why personal relationships in this situation are very important. Not, you know, not. Uh, and I'm not. I don't think it was photo opportunities. I don't think Trump was doing photo opportunities. I think he was establishing a personal relationship because he's in deep trouble at home. The establishment wants him out now. They're going to do everything possible to get him out. They're, they're, off, they're forcing RT to register, as, and they're going to force the Chinese papers to register, and all of this and it's, it's, it's coming from Congress. The Congress, there's a battle now, the Congress is getting ready, you know, there's a very, it's a real crisis in the United States right now. <coughs> Was Trump strengthened by his visit? Yes. Internally? Yes, but he was also triggered, he's going to, his visit has triggered a much greater attack on him. Is triggering a much greater attack on it. So, so this is this is where 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 things are. It's just very serious because what you're talking about in the context of a financial collapse and a resurrection of a different of a of a of a new paradigm is the end of the oligarchy. It's the end of this whole system. It's the end of the offshore financial system as we were talking about. It's the end of all of it. Now, the other, another thing that's going on that I'm looking into for the movement, I have to write something probably this Monday, is um, the, the, the green light has been given by the Trump administration to go after the pharmaceutical companies and the, of the opioid, opioid crisis. However, uh, because the Obama administration established the changes in the laws which allow for the loopholes, which allow for this massive crisis to develop, and there are many people in the in, in the Justice Department who are who are still supporting that policy, and the issue of, of who controls the Justice Department is not in, it's not been resolved. What's happening is that the attack on the pharmaceutical companies and the opioid uh, is, is is occurring at the local level, it's occurring at the state level. So what you have is is state level operations being run by with the support of Trump, which are not being supported at the, at the, at the federal level in terms of going after the, the, this aspect of the drug trade. But that's only a small step. Bigger steps have to, have to occur. But it's not so much these particular steps in and of themselves, it's the directionality of where this can go. This can go to bigger things. This can go in the future, it could go to a, an agreement between Trump, Xi Jinping, Putin, and Modi to pull together the military and other means to wipe the whole drug trade out completely, international, potential. That's what you have, potential. Now, with, 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 if this thing moves in that direction, I mean, I'm not, that's a ways off, but you can do that now. You can have that kind of cooperation between countries. You can wipe this whole thing out. You can shut down all of the, the heroin growing areas. You know, you can clean up, you know, the banks, the money laundering, 
You can put in prison all of the international bankers that are involved in the drug trade. I mean, you could do all of that if you have collaboration between ma the major nations uh, around what's in the common good, what's in the common common uh, good. I'm, I'm saying that that's where this would, can go. That's that's the direction this can go in, and nobody more keenly understands this than the uh, than the um, than the um, people who run this system, that run the international system, the, the oligarchy, the, and so forth. Now, the situation in the Middle East, and I'm going to end with that, is very screwed up, it's very confused. It appears to, to us that there is a blind spot with Trump and it centers around Iran. And there's going to be an all-out effort to, to tri trigger the Iran thing, uh, to, 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 to destroy the, the momentum that Trump has on an international scale with, with China and potential with Russia and all that to be triggered by, by triggering Trump into, into some kind of action against Iran. Whether that would be uh, um, provoked by Saudi Arabia or Israel or both uh, targeting Hezbollah or what have you. I do smell, I do smell a plot. And I do smell that, that Trump has a blind spot there. And, and in, in that he has, a, he has a, a, perhaps a prejudice or pre, preconceived idea of Iran that's not, that's not, that's not accurate. And so th this is something we, we, we have to be concerned about. Wasn't, wasn't Iran part of the evil empires that he mentioned in his UN speech? The evil to destroy what? Yeah, this was this was in that he had, that was the Iranian component of it, which was yeah. which was at odds with 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 the with the actual uh, yeah exactly. So <coughs> so anyhow, that's where I'm going to end. A few comments. Okay, here we go. <laughs>